Well, howdy, Freedom Wranglers. How y'all doing? Howdy doody. We have got a very special guest, special, near and dear to my heart, um, and it is my son, Benjamin. I'm sorry. Hi, how are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> we are so excited to have Ben with us. And, um, you know, today is super special for me, and I know it's special for Ben. Ben is going to share his testimony about how God just works, how he steps into our situations. He chases after us and pursues us, and we don't even realize it at the time that he's coming after us. But, um, you know, I'm going to pass this over to Ben. Ben is my oldest son, and um, it is an honor and a privilege to have Ben here on the podcast. So, Ben, go on, man. <laughs> go on. <laughs> All righty. So... Uh, I just want to thank you guys for allowing me to share my testimony today. Uh, but I'm just going to give a little backstory, uh, you know, a little history, you know, as to, you know, my past. Uh, so, you know, at age seven, I was diagnosed with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, so, you know, that was really a shock to me. But, you know, God, I know he has plans for that. But I... Uh, you know, I was raised in the church my whole life. I was in the worship team. I uh, and my parents dedicated me when I was a child. I uh, and you know, I know God has a certain. I uh, you know, He really has ordained a certain things for me. I uh, but you know, with dealing with I uh, you know my DMD, I uh, there was a lot of things that came with it, and you know, pain was one of those things, and I. Uh, you know, I, at a point in my life, I turned to things I shouldn't have turned to, like medical marijuana to help get rid of the pain. And, you know, that ultimately led me down a, a bad path. Uh, Cause I, you know, started using it more than just to, you know, get away from the pain. Cause, you know, there was a point in my life I was, you know, playing the church part. You know, I wasn't fully in, I was just, you know, putting on that, you know, church outfit, you know, in a way, you know, on Wednesdays and Sundays, just playing the part. Uh, and, you know, and ultimately hid things, you know, secretive things and had a secret life in a way. Uh, but, you know, with 2020, you know, a lot of things happened, you know, not only with COVID, but uh, I, you know, my pain certainly, you know, was elevated. And, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one, but you know, I felt alone, uh, and like there's no one there with me. Uh, but, you know, I turned to that. And then, you know, years later, when I was able to, you know, buy alcohol and things like that, you know, I was turning to that as, you know, another escape uh, to, you know, just get away from life and put life in a box and, you know, forget about it. And, you know, I was addicted to that. And, you know, it just got me to a point I was so alone and honestly I turned away from God you know I felt like God hadn't you know isn't helping me and wasn't going to be able to you know be there as a friend uh and it was late 2020 I'd reached the point where I had ultimately started reaching people in uh, a community that you know ultimately wasn't the right place to find acceptance in uh you know, and unfortunately, that was, you know, the LGBT community. And I was looking for friendship and acceptance in that way. And, you know, that ultimately led, led me down a worse path. Uh, and, you know, I was doing things I certainly wouldn't, God wouldn't have approved of and doesn't. Uh, but, you know, God just ultimately worked through me and helped, you know, mend me, even though I had you know, completely turned away from God. I had, you know, said things about God, like, and ultimately that it was just heartbreaking. Honestly, I was in a place where I was, you know, just ultimately in a terrible place of my life. And, you know, I was still, you know, using medical marijuana to try and find happiness. And, you know, I still wasn't finding happiness. I, uh, but, you know, God, used medical marijuana to put me in a state where I was, you know, in severe pain and God, you know, 
ultimately I had to go to the hospital and God allowed, you know, me going through that to allow people to minister me to me. Uh, and I had a nurse, she was taking care of me. And, uh, you know, one day it was, uh, a day before Passover. Uh, so this is right before Easter. Uh, and she came in and she was, uh, giving me assistance in bathing, uh, cause you know, they do certain things like that in the hospital, you know, certain things they have to do. Uh, and she asked me if it's okay if she played some worship music. And I was like, sure you can. And, you know, I ultimately felt at that point, I think I was in such a broken place that God was, you know, I was open to God again because I had been hurt through many things, you know, for the church and just feeling, feeling alone and, you know, just like there wasn't a friend there, but, you know, she played a worship song that just reminded me and started making me think of, you know, my family, us worshiping together and having those intimate moments with God and also those bonding moments together Uh, but she played uh, the song called Thank You for the Blood uh, by Charity Gale. And, you know, that song, it talks about certain things, uh, you know, how sin separated us and how the breach was far wide. And, you know, that later talks about, you know, how God comes in and he, you know, Jesus sacrificed himself for us. And in that moment, I, you know, began to sob and just kind of cry because I was, in such a broken part of my life, but, you know, I ultimately believe, you know, whether she was an angel or just a godly person, uh, that God used her to ultimately, you know, clean me in a way to prepare me for what was to come, uh, you know, for Jesus to get a hold of me. Uh, and, you know, I just feel like God places certain people, whether they're angels or you know, just godly people in our lives for a reason, you know, and it's ultimately in those moments where we feel broken, you know, and I'm sure I'm not the only one where this happened, where there's, you know, almost feels like an angel is in there in that moment, just with you and just almost ministering to you in a way. Uh, but that following day, I was released from the hospital and it was Passover day and I asked my mom because she was there to pick me up. I asked if I could come home and stay permanently. And so you had moved out, like get back yeah. just a little bit. Um, you'd made a decision uh, and told us in March that you were moving out. And of course, for us, mm -hmm. it was like, we can't stop him. He's 21. And if that's what he wants to do, that's what he wants to do. Of course, we had lots of questions about your care and all of those types of things that were very valid questions. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, you you moved out and you'd been in the hospital prior to moving out. And that was a week because I was in a hospital uh, the week prior for a whole week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we moved you out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. I got, I moved out on a completely other side of town, about 40 minutes away. And as far as you could get away from us. <laughs> yeah. It was almost like I was separating, you know, God as much from God as I was separating from you guys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you had moved out. And then when you're in the hospital, you asked, yeah, to, to come yeah. home and I'll let you go mm -hmm. on. Yeah. And, you know, you guys did set certain terms of me coming back. You know, I had to separate myself from, you know, certain things of my past, uh, you know, like doing drugs and going to alcohol and smoking and, you know, and also living the homosexual lifestyle that I was trying to live. Uh, and you guys, you know, invited me back and I came home and you know, they had prepared a feast of lamb and certain, you know, pita bread and certain things uh, that they were going to do for Passover before they even realized that I was coming home. And I know it was completely unexpected and it was just, it was God. Yes. And, you know, it felt like that uh, story that Jesus talks about and Luke, you know, about the prodigal son. And I just want to read a bit of that because, you know, that really ministers to me uh 
So in Luke, uh, let me see here. It is in Luke 15, verse 20 uh, to 24. And it says, and he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to his father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly to the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring us a fattened calf and kill it and let us celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and it's found. And, yeah. you know, that verse just really felt like that moment, you know. And, you know, there was a feast waiting there for me. And, you know, I was accepted back. I wasn't turned away. And, you know, with all the things I had done, to my family and God, I just felt like there was no way I could come back, you know, but God moved and I'll let you share, uh, you know, cause you had certain things, you know, you did for me that, uh, you know, I didn't know about until you told me after and certain things God had shown you. Yeah. During that time, it was, um, we went through a roller coaster with Ben, um, it began really uh, at the end of last year where he started to really display and disinterest in church. And uh, I don't want to go. It's boring. Um, I don't have any desire to do this. And, um, you know, you guys have to understand that we have led worship together since the kids were, you know, 12 and 13 years old. We have always done worship together in one way or another they competed in different competitions leading worship both of our children and so to have him say I don't want to do this anymore um, and there were things that were becoming more and more evident to us with Ben but the real clencher for me was in January we went on a cruise of uh 20 yeah it was this year we went in cruise yes, in January. 2023 gosh I can't believe it was this year it feels so long ago um and on that cruise, you know, Ben has always been very independent, regardless of the wheelchair or not. He's yeah. always done his thing. And so, you know, initially he was like, look, I'm going to go do my own thing. And we were like, yeah, we'll meet up for meals. We'll see you and have some family time, you know, that kind of thing. So um, one of the days we were passing through the casino and I saw Ben at a slot machine and there was this guy next to him. And, um, you know, we walked up to see what was going on. And the guy says, Oh, we're just here talking smack about guys. And I was like, that was weird. And I looked at John and we walked away and I said, I think that he's pursuing a lifestyle with the LGBT alphabet community. Cause I don't remember all the letters they have now at this stage. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> so um, and he was like, do you really think so? I said, yeah. And then progressively on that trip, Ben was drunk more and more. Um, he was going to the after parties and stuff. And we came into his room one evening just to check on him because uh, we hadn't heard from him. And he was just like literally passed out. He'd thrown himself off of his wheelchair, was half in the chair, half on the bed, just very, the whole trip, he was drunk. That's just the truth. Yeah um, the entire trip. And we were just like, this is a problem. It's actually ruining our vacation as well. And so, you know, we addressed that when we got home and then things began to escalate where he was going out saying he was going to one place and, and was going to another. And, you know, mm -hmm. there was a lot of, um, deception that was going on when we had pursued medical marijuana, Benjamin was underage. And I always believed in my heart if someone needs something like that, I'd always been a proponent to say, yes, if it helps them deal with their pain, but they're not yeah. addicted to it. I believed this lie that's out there that you don't get addicted to it, but you do get addicted to marijuana. Yeah. And, um, you know, Ben was using more and more and we would, we could tell like that he was using it more and more. He was very like, just not here. That's the truth. He was a very yeah. physical body was here, but mentally he was not. And um, I instantaneously began to pray because I knew he was going places he shouldn't be. I knew that he was getting involved in things that, that he knew was wrong. But I also knew that preaching at Benjamin was not going to be the answer. Now, there were moments that I was like, mm -hmm. Ben, do you think God is pleased with you? And he would just roll his eyes and whatever. But at 21, it's like, 
he's at an age of accountability. And I told him at one point, Mm -hmm. I looked at him and I said, you're responsible for your salvation, not me. You cannot get to heaven on my coattails. It just won't happen. Mom serves God for herself. She doesn't serve God for you or for anybody else in this family. And so during that time, the Holy Spirit prompted me to go into his room when he was not here and lay in his bed and pray. The Holy Spirit prompted me that when I folded his clothes after washing them to pray over his clothes, to pray a hedge of protection around him, to anoint his pillow with anointing oil and pray over it. He didn't know, but God knew. And I really kept pushing God in the way that go after him, God, however you have to. And then Ben told us that he wanted, he came to us and he told us that um, he believed that he was gay. And he was going to pursue that lifestyle. And there was nothing we were going to say that was going to change that. Um, To which my response was, I know you're not. You're making a choice here. Um, You're looking for acceptance. And there was a lot of denial in that conversation from yourself to us. And then you really started to cut yourself off from us. And from anybody we hung out with, you had to make choices. Like we love to go to things, different events here in Jacksonville. And every year they have like a world of nations event where you can go and try different food and see different cultures. And we have always loved going to that. We find that so much fun because we are foodies, you know, that's, just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the fun we have. And um, Ben was going to go with us, but it was either go with us or go spend time with this person that was giving him attention. Um, and lavishing him with gifts and so on and so forth. And so he chose that person over us and it hurt, but I came to the understanding that I said, God, he doesn't belong to me. And I had that conversation with the Lord that Lord, I dedicated him to you when he was six months old. He's your responsibility. I have done my job in raising him up in the ways that he should go. Your word says he won't depart from it. But right now it looks like he's departing from it. So it's your job, God, not mine. Mm -hmm. So you fast forward to Ben telling us he's moving out. (laughs) And John and I looked at each other in private. And I don't even know if you know that we had this conversation, Ben. So this might be something new to you. (laughs) Your dad and I looked at each other and I was like, I'm not helping him. If he wants to move out, he can figure it out himself. Because you would have need. we knew you needed help. And your dad just looked at me and he said, what would Jesus do? And I said, well, he would help him. And he said, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to help him. We're going to love him. And we're going to let him know that he's loved and he always has a place to return. So we walked through that process and unbeknownst to Ben, he's in the hospital. We have wrangled about eight people from our church and said, Ben's moving out and he doesn't have any help apart from me and John. And I think that it would speak volumes to him if you guys could show up to help. So that morning, while Ben is still in the hospital, these people showed up and took all of his stuff, loaded it up for us, brought pickup trucks and took it over and unloaded it and set up his room. And in the process, they went through and they had post-it notes. And they wrote encouraging things all over these post-its. And then Amanda, Pastor Amanda said, can we just pray? And there was a guy there that he was going to be sharing an apartment with. And I was like, yeah, I said, he's going to think we're crazy, but whatever, you know? So we just stood in Ben's bedroom and we prayed. We prayed for protection over him. We prayed for God to come after him. And we let go and we walked away and I went and I picked you up from the hospital because you got released that day and brought you back. And you saw all those things. I don't know what that yeah. did to you. What what was your reaction to that at that time? At that point in time, I, you know, was very against it. I wasn't happy to find those things because uh, I took them all down and threw them away. But, you know, I know God did something through those people putting those up and me reading them but you know not wanting to actually you know take them to heart yeah but you know god moved and you know that other guy out in that apartment he was like they're crazy people coming in and praying and, <laughs> yeah i figured he would think that we and at that 
point in time, I kind of agreed. Sure. You know, I did agree, but. Well, that's where you were. You know, that was the reality of where you were at. And um, so, yeah, so we left and um, we came home and we just went about our lives. And then the next thing we get a phone call that I got a call from Ben. I'm really not well. And, you know, he had been lying to us. He hadn't been buying marijuana himself. Someone else was getting it and he was using it. And um, medically, the THC inside medical marijuana can be so strong that it builds up in your system very rapidly and can make you extremely sick. And that's what was happening to Ben. He was having THC toxicity and it wasn't the first time he'd had it. So he told us that he was taking himself to the hospital and tough love. It was really, really hard. We said, okay, let us know where you're at. Mm. Um, and we'll come and see you, but we're not staying overnight like we've done in the past. And so we did that. We went and we saw him and we told him we loved him and then we left. And then I found out that he'd been moved to another ward. So I went to check on him on that ward and, um, it was hard. It was so hard, uh, going in there that morning and seeing him in the state that he was in because he was a mess physically. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know when the last time you was, you'd shaved or your hair had been brushed your teeth when you'd had a shower. It was several days since you'd had a shower. Yeah. And, um, it was like everything that was on the inside of you, all of the sin, all the ugly was manifesting on the outside at that stage. And my heart broke, you know, it literally broke. And I walked out of the room and I had to take a moment and I called your dad and, and then I came back and you said to me, I think God's trying to get my attention. And I was like, what makes you say that? And you told me, well, every time I try to play secular music, Chris Tomlin keeps playing. (laughs) And I don't want to listen to that. And I was like, well, he has a way of doing things like that. And I just kind of left it there. And I said, you know, he loves you. And I did quote Romans 8, 38 and 39, letting you know that nothing can separate you from the love of God. But you made a statement and you said, but I have said and done things that I don't know that he can forgive me for. Yeah. And, you know, that's how I felt at that point in time, but I had said things and done things against God and there was no way he'd take me back, but, you know, he forgives anything you do. And, you know, I think those are thoughts that the enemy plants in our mind, but you've done X, Y, and Z. You, God's never going to take you back. What sin you've done, you know, are unforgivable, but you know, he forgives anything, you know, from, in his eyes, all sin is the same. Whether you've lied, uh, you know, cheated, murdered, whatever you've done, God can forgive you. Absolutely. And, you know, and I think also the way you guys went about, you know, things. You didn't preach at me. You, you know, did things that Jesus would have done. Because, unfortunately, majority of the church, I think, they have that mindset, oh, we need to preach the gospel at them, but it's, we need to do certain acts that Jesus would have done. Mm. And, mm. you know, Jesus is the prime exam- example of what, you know, we as Christians need to be doing. And I think many Christians forget that, you know, they just think, oh, we need to preach the gospel and tell them that what they're doing is a sin. But, you know, that isn't what Jesus wants us to do. But, he does want it, you know, us to tell them about our their sins, and but he wants us to do it in a different way than we, you know, think we should. Yeah, and that was the one big thing. Like we sat with our pastors and we shared with them everything that was going on, and their immediate response was love him. Mm-hmm. The answer is to love him through this, and that is the thing that the Holy Spirit kept saying to me and Dad was love him through this. Just love him. Just show him my love. Do not reject him. I know it's frustrating, but just love him. And so we did that. And that same day in the Mm -hmm. hospital, the Holy Spirit said, you need to wash his feet. And so I said to you, Ben, I don't know when was the last time you had a shower, but would it be okay if I got a warm washcloth and 
maybe washed your face and washed your feet. And you were like, no, no, you don't need to do that for me. You were embarrassed basically. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, because as a mom, in my heart, I washed your feet when you were a baby. I washed your face, your face. I wiped off all the mess that you would make when you ate. And so in my heart, it was just an act of my love for you as your mom. And um, you did let me do that. And then I said, all right, I'm going to head out. And I just said to one of the nurses, I said, can you please make sure he gets some type of a bath? Because he's not had one for several days. And I'll come and help, but he just needs to be cleaned up. And um, that's when that nurse came in and did what she did, unbeknownst to me. I never once said I'm a Christian. I never once said my son's a prodigal, blah, blah, blah. None of it. And um, I walked in while she was doing that. I came back that day and walked in and she's giving you this bath and the music is on and you were bawling. And I filled with tears and had to walk out of the room because I thought, first of all, let me give my son his privacy. But secondly... <laughs> God's in the process of doing something here. Yeah. So I left and I called your dad and I said, God is doing it. And he said, what do you mean? I said, God is working on Ben so hard because the Holy Spirit had spoken to me when I stepped in that elevator that day. He said, the prodigal is coming home today. And he said, you already have the fatted calf. You've already prepared the feast. The celebration is set, just be patient. And so that was what we did. And we brought you home on Good yeah. Friday. And, you know, I didn't know my grandparents were coming over, but uh, my mom's parents, they came over as well. And, you know, we had had dinner, you know, my parents didn't really bring up, you know, my salvation, you know, coming back to God, but, you know, my grandfather he just asked me and he was like do you want to give yourself back to God and do you want to you know invite him back in your heart and so you know I did you know I accepted God back in my heart and I just felt in that moment an overwhelming amount of peace and joy in that moment and I just I just thank God for everything he's done because you know, I don't know where I would be if he hadn't come in and rescued me, you know, mm. where I was ultimately, you know, in kind of in the grave in a way. I was digging my own hole and God just picked me up out that hole and just saved me mm. and radically changed my life. And uh, I believe it was a couple months after that I got baptized uh, right before 4th of July that weekend. Uh, and so I got baptized and you know he has done so many more wonderful things in my life than you know I can count and you know last no it was this month I uh, so I had recently quit my job last uh, month uh, you know to pursue other things in God and you know ultimately get a break because I was feeling overwhelmed at work mm -hmm. uh, and you know I do get disability benefits from the government I uh, and I called them and they were like, you probably won't get it till January of next year because everything is delayed by two months behind that they look at. Uh, and, you know, I didn't know this, but my dad saw it first because uh, he can check my account and stuff. But uh, uh, so I, <laughs> I know stalkers much. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I looked at my account and there was money from Social Security and I praise was so worried. Yeah. And praise be to God. Cause I was so worried about how am I going to make ends meet for these three months that I won't have income for, yeah. but you know, God moved and he's still moving in my health and he's moving in so many ways in my life more than, you know, I can think or you know, count, you know, there's so many things he does in our lives that, you know, we can't count. Yeah. God is so good. And, um, 
just to see you from darkness to light, to see you step out of, be pulled out of the pit. And it was by God himself, you know, that just pulled course, you out of the yeah. pit. And for you to come back to Christ, recommit your life on Good Friday, Passover, and then on Sunday, Easter Sunday, because I had asked you when you moved out, do you think you'll come to church on Easter? And you were like, yeah, probably not. Well, do you want to come to the house? Your friend is invited. You could have dinner with us that day. And you were like, I don't know. We'll see. But to see you from this place of no, probably not to I'm coming to church on Easter Sunday. It was such an unbelievable resurrection Sunday of just joy and excitement because that's why Jesus died and he rose. It was for moments like that in everybody's life that he did it. And um, I just want to backpedal a little bit and give you an opportunity here, Ben, because there were some things that that ultimately led toward where you ended up. And I know that one of it had, you know, some of it had to do with pain, loneliness and rejection. Um, But also you were tapping into some different things that a lot of young people tap into and have access today on their phones. So I want to give you the liberty and the freedom to speak to moms and dads from firsthand of what access kids have, even though you think you've got a grip on it. And I mean, and this was going on prior to you being an adult, there were things you had access to way prior as a minor that even though we put everything in place, we knew to put in place, we thought we had it sewn up as parents and then come to find out there were still things, there were still loopholes and workarounds. So I just want you to share from that perspective to parents, to moms and dads today. Yeah, so, you know, I've had access to many things that, you know, as you said, parents think, you know, I put all these safeguards in place uh, and, you know, my kid won't be exposed to certain things. But, you know, in the world we live in with technology, there it's always loopholes. And, you know, whether that's you block Safari, they can't watch or see adult content on there. And, you know, there are loopholes. You can download another browser, say Google or Firefox or whatever, and, you know, watch or see things on there and then delete it so your parents don't know. And then you got Snapchat, which, you know, many people think it's a, you know, oh, it's just for, you know, sending cute photos or using the filters, you know, things like that. But, you know, you can meet people on there that are very, you know, just inappropriate things. You can meet people that you wouldn't want your kid to meet ever. And you can, you know, send photos and other things that are inappropriate. And, you know, I was, you know, doing both of those things. And, and God just, you know, he wants parents to ultimately be aware of what your kids are doing. Because, you know, even though the photos disappear after 24 hours, or however long after you see it, you know, whatever, but, you know, they're still out there, they're in servers stored, until the end of time till God comes back and you know I just think parents need to be more aware of what their kids are doing and watching and other things like that but I will say it's sad though because innocence in this world has gone at such a very early age for children and you know it's not it's just happening in our school systems as well and you know just ultimately exposing them to things that they shouldn't be exposed to so i just think you as parents need to be more aware you know what your children are doing and you know i'm not trying to preach to you because you know i don't have children of my own uh but you know you just got to be more aware be more you know vigilant you know and you may think you have it all under control but you know just watch what your kids do watch how they act and you know, just pray that God would give you an insight. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's what the Holy Spirit did with me. He gave me insight. I know you must have hated it at times where I'm like, dude, I know you're doing X, Y, and Z and you shouldn't. And I hadn't even seen anything on the phone and you would be just like, you know, how does she know this? (laughs) And it was all God. It was all God. And that is parents have got to seek God and the Holy Spirit and ask for discernment. Um, Ben guardrails, what kind of guardrails would you suggest people to put into their lives that, you know, if they're struggling with, whether it be 
Snapchat pornography, you know, yeah. getting onto these different dating apps, whatever it is. What is your suggestion that someone that's battling loves Jesus, but's battling mm-hmm. that? What's your what is your suggestion for guardrails there? Well, the first thing would be, uh, you know, if you're doing those things or watching those things at night, you know, take all your technology, put it in another room and just leave it, you know, where it's not right in front of you, where it's, you know, you can just quickly get on there and you're like, this won't harm anything, but do, you know, do that. And then also get someone in your life to keep you accountable, Mm -hmm. ask you every day, you know, how are you doing? Did you watch any, you know, anything inappropriate or, you know, get on a certain app or do certain things. You have to have someone like that in your life to keep you accountable. And then, you know, also if you're able to get someone to put blockers on your phone or certain things like that, or, you know, just get blockers put in place, you know, whether it's app restrictions or you can't download certain apps without that person putting in a passcode or certain things. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, I would say as well as just, you know, in those moments, you feel weakness, just start praying and, you know, really put on the armor of God every day, because that is another thing that, you know, protects us from the attacks of the enemy, which it is, uh, you know, him trying to entrap us in these, you know, lustful things, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the big thing that you said earlier is acceptance. Um, Everybody wants to be accepted. I think that's what we're seeing. Uh, Jamie, you and I have talked about that so many times. Oh, yeah. You know. um, It's a lacking. You know, people, they feel whenever there's a lack or they're not getting... Uh, they're not getting communicated to, or they just feel mm-hmm. like they're an outsider and don't feel like they're included in acceptance. That's, that's, those are the ones that need Jesus. They need mm-hmm. to feel his love. Mm-hmm. And, but as Christians too, we do struggle. We struggle with sin. Mm-hmm. It's always there. And like you're saying the the whole internet thing, oh my gosh, that that's the biggest pitfall for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, and Instagram as well. I mean, you can judge yourself by looking at someone and be like, I, you know, don't have any worth. I'm not as pretty or as handsome as them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's like the private, the secret DMs. I get those. And I'm just like, who are these people? Weirdos? Like for me, it's just like a delete because it doesn't doesn't tempt me because I'm solid in my relationship with Christ, solid in my relationship with my husband. But there are some people that are lonely that are desperate for somebody to like them. And so they get catfished on these sites and catfishing leads to all kinds of things from blackmail to, I mean, an inappropriate relationships, human trafficking happens out of that. There's just so much, but you know, um, we as Christians, like you said, have to put on the armor, Ben. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What would you say is one of your, your go-to verses, Ben? Uh, well, my go-to verse, uh, you know, one that has really encouraged me through, you know, coming out of my, you know, sinful lifestyle, uh, is the one you mentioned earlier, uh, Romans 8, uh, 38 to 39. Uh, and, you know, it's where it mentions uh, that, you know, before that, you know, this is in Romans, where Paul is talking to the Romans, you know, and you know, the Romans back then were kind of ruthless and did many things that, you know. Like today. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it says, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. That reminder that there's nothing that can separate us from him. Mm -hmm. So your heart, Ben, I know you have shared this with me is to, is for that community to see them come to Jesus. Yeah. And, you know, and I've seen some of that revival take place like in Texas where, you know, there was just, 
a parade of hundreds of them, you know, not parading for, you know, their lifestyles, uh, but parading for God. And, you know, it's just showing that many of them are, you know, being broken of, you know, that lifestyle, which ultimately is a demonic presence that gets a hold of you. And, you know, I've watched this guy on YouTube. He has, uh, he goes out to these events and, uh, you know, he just preaches the gospel and I've seen many people come up. Some of them are open to hearing God, but some of them, it's almost like they're possessed by a demon and they are, you know, cause they will say things that are, you know, are honestly demonic and, you know, can break someone down, but, you know, he just keeps preaching the gospel and, you know, he doesn't let that get to him. And, you know, I, I know that community, they just need God because, you know, they can say, oh, it's not a choice. I was born this way. And that's not true because, you know, many parts of the Bible mention, you know, how it's, you know, meant to be a relationship between a man and a woman, not, you know, a woman and a woman or a man and a man. And, you know, that, you know, it just breaks my heart because, you know, I can now preach to those people because I know what it's like to go through that and it's just sad seeing people that are like that and you know they do drugs you know they just seek pleasure and and happiness in places that they shouldn't be seeking it in and the chains can be broken and you are evident of that proof that those chains mm -hmm. can be broken what would you say to Christians is the best way to respond to that community it would be to love them because god is you know everything that jesus talks about is love your neighbor you know love other people and we need to love like jesus loves instead of you know if you've seen those signs people have on the side of the road you know you're if you're sinning, you're going straight to hell you know like signs like that that's not the way to reach people and, you know, we need to do it out of love, whether that's, uh, you know, helping someone that may be struggling with, you know, rent or other things, you know, if they're living a lifestyle that's not pleasing to God, we can help them and love them, but we don't have to accept their sin mm -hmm. and support their sin. And, you know, that's what we need to do is just love people in that community that, you know, and I have heard this from many of them when, you know, I was for say at bars or other things, you know, they would say, I'm not, I don't feel loved. I need to find love in, you know, a certain place. And, you know, God has all the love that we need. And as Christians, we can be the ones that show that love. And you had an army, Benjamin, you had an <laughs> army of people praying for you, sweetheart. I, know I mean, I did. we and... were just fasting and praying for you. And we just knew that God was going to touch your life. We just knew it. And I'm so glad that he got a hold of me, yes. you know, within it was, I was living that way for about six months and he just got a hold of me so quickly. And, you know, I'm just so happy that he got a hold of me because he is, he has blessed me with so many things and, I'm just happy to have a friend like him in my life. He's, he's the best friend that we could ever have. And um, I know that uh, for us, the joy was unspeakable, you know, and um, learning to love through pain and to love like you've never been hurt is something that your father and I really had to work out we had to walk it out and um it was our goal not just to be witnesses to you but to be witnesses to you know your friend and to show them that yeah we might look like crazy christians but we love it doesn't mean and i told you that i don't condone your lifestyle but i love you mm -hmm. and yeah. One of the biggest mistakes, and I'm going to just say it, that a lot of Christian parents make is absolutely rejecting their child when they come out with something that they don't agree with. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest mistake that Christian parents make. 
He knew where we stood. Ben has always known where we stood on that. He knows the word of God. So it wasn't a shock to him when I said, I love you, but I don't love the sin. Hmm. We never once said, get out of our house. We never once said, you're not, you don't belong here. You're not going to be like that in this house. Get out. Nothing. We did have guidelines in our home. You're not going to do drugs. You're not going to get drunk. You know, you're not going to be bringing people here and whatever that's not going to happen. And so in his mind, I know that that's what drove him toward the direction of moving out, but we never rejected in that way. And I have heard story after story with people in that community that their parents kicked them out 14, 15, you know, rejected them from the family. They're not welcome at the table. They're not welcome home. And that's not okay. And it's regardless if they're Christian or not, you know, if you want to call them secular people or secular parents, the world, you know, yeah. they do it as well. Yeah. And, it's... and I, don't, I don't understand the whole, like, they'll, they'll kick them out if they're gay, but if they're having sex before marriage, they, they still keep them in their house. I don't understand that. Like they buy the sin. condoms for them and they buy the, you know, the birth control. I mean, that's the truth. Yeah. It makes yeah. Sense. yeah. I don't understand that. No, no. It's a status thing. And, but unfortunately being gay, lesbian, trans, non-binary, all the different things, it's becoming more and more acceptable in our society. Mm -hmm. The lines are so blurred. It is. And I feel like that's ultimately the way the enemy is attacking my generation. And, you know, because we want to find acceptance because, but we're looking in the wrong places and I also feel it's another way the enemy is just trying to stop, you know, more children uh, being born for God and living for God. Because if, like, let's first say, you know, trans people, they can't have kids anymore. And even though they want to say they can and, you know, try and make out the face, but that isn't a ton of... Ugh. Atomically, I can't even say that word. Anatomically, uh, anatomically, yeah. yeah. Yes. Like anatomically. Yes. Yeah. There we go. We're all there. <laughs> we see big words words you, Benny. <laughs> I know. But it's it's just the way the enemy is just trying to take out people for God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like like abortion, you know, doing yeah. that, stopping procreation because he's threatened. I mean, we've talked about it before, Jamie, the enemy is so threatened. So he's trying anything and everything to stifle the kingdom of God from growing. Yeah. And he's taken sex. Yeah. He's taken sex by storm mm-hmm. and sex is supposed to be a very wonderful thing between a man and a woman. Mm-hmm. And he's just taken yeah. it. Yeah. And we need to take sex back again is what we need. <laughs> <laughs> he's taken the rainbow. She's taken sex back. I'm just scared. <laughs> Get rid of the alphabets too. <laughs> yeah, the alphabet is for us. Man, Ben, that is just you have you've hit the nail on the head with so many different things. And um I don't have any other questions or anything, but uh, Jamie, do you have anything you you know you want to ask or I just gotta say that um your testimony, Benjamin, is is so on point right now and it right now with what I have a 14 year old, you know, Uriah. So it's just like, it's so needful for your generation and especially not only the physical things that you're dealing with showing strength. And it just goes along with that verse that God is going to use the ones that are humble and he's going to lift you up. He's lifting you up right now. And he's showing you at all the keys of the kingdom. And I'm just so excited to see what God is going to do in your life and through your life. And yeah. it's just, it's a beautiful story. I love what God is doing in your life. I love seeing the strength of the Lord just working in and through you. It's just, it's the most beautiful uh, story. I love it. And I thank you for sharing yeah yeah you're welcome and i'm just you know i'm sharing what god has done in my life this wasn't you know it isn't about me everything we do every day we live it's all about god that's what it should be about and you know he works every single day he you know gives me joy every single day even though my circumstances from the outside you're like how can you be happy you know but you know the joy of the lord is our strength and he just, he is just an amazing God. And I'm so happy that, you know, he worked through people to 
you know, use them to get to me. Yes, God. And that if for, I will just sum this up that the enemy tried to snuff Ben out early on in his life. Um, I was seven weeks pregnant with him and almost lost him. Mm. Um, he was born six weeks early by emergency cesarean. Um, and you know, praise the Lord that all he had was some jaundice. Um, but you know, then the enemy really tried to take him out with muscular dystrophy, um, to destroy his life. And now we fast forward, cause that doesn't run in our family. It's generally a genetic thing and it's not genetically, I don't carry it. It's normally the mom that carries it. I don't carry it. Um, but God has given Ben talent and gifts with singing, uh, that, you know, blow me and Jamie, our voices out of the water. He's very, very talented. And, um, you know, Ben is very humble and he would never say this, but, you know, he even walked away from the fact that he competed at different things and he won multiple times, you know, singing, um, songs for God, but he was like, I don't need that and walk away. And, but God is using him again because the enemy is tried. And then he tried this way, he tried to mm -hmm. isolate you. He tried to take you and pluck you from the Lord's hand. But, you know, God just stepped in and he said, no, he belongs to me. And, uh, so I am just, you're his Ben. And there has I been, am. there've been prophecies and words over his life, you know, that he has, he has a calling, an evangelistic calling on his life to tell others about Jesus. And I just think, you know, I'm, I know I'm your mom, but I think this is just the beginning of what God's going to do. You Where he's just gonna... begun. <laughs> yep. Don't you it dare certainly think. is. <laughs> yeah. 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 So God is good. Ben, we thank you so much. You. And we can't wait to yeah, hear sure. how God uses you and takes you to the new levels that he's got for you. And, um, Ben, if there's anybody that, you know, maybe wants to reach out, that's, that's battling some of the stuff that they, they want to know how to turn to Jesus. Would you be open to somebody reaching out to you? They can, yeah, certainly. Us and we can forward it on. Yeah. If you, if you've got somebody in your life, you know, that that really needs to hear this testimony, pass it yeah. on. They can email us. And if they've got questions, they want to talk to Ben, somebody who understands, and they want to walk away from that and come back to Jesus that yeah. he's standing there with open arms so you can email us at freedomwranglers at gmail.com and uh, we're going to put that up here for you guys and i've got a few pictures that you know we're going to throw in here for ben so if you're listening to the podcast check out the youtube channel subscribe to it uh, that's where you can see ben and uh, you can hear his testimony there as well but we also love you download the podcasts too so we thank you ben Yes, thank you. All right, Benny, you are a wrangler. Thanks for joining us today. Over and out. All right. So, Ben Goodman, we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And those... <laughs> and you've received him by faith, now walk by faith. Amen? Amen. Okay, that's a big, tall order. Right. <laughs>